Vor kurzem ist in Deutschland ihr Roman Babel erschienen und Babel spielt im Oxford der 1830er Jahre. Es geht also in die Welt der Akademie und in der kennt sie sich tatsächlich sehr gut aus. Hier ist Rebecca F. Kwang. Awesome. So great. Hello, you thank came you for having from me. America? Yes. For us? Just for you. <laughs> <laughs> um, excuse my English. Um, I'm, I'm trying, but <laughs> I guess after reading Babel, um, I got nervous because you seem to be an expert on language. But I thought you actually studied language when you were writing Babel, but you didn't major in English while writing it, right? No, I didn't major in linguistics yeah. either. And actually, even though there's a bit of German in the book, I'm very bad at German. But you know I don't some know words. Any. I know a few words. Actually, the social media group, uh, the social media team did a game with me before this program where they were showing me flashcards of German words and I had to guess what they meant. And I didn't know any, but then they had a flashcard that had a very long phrase on it with no words I recognized, but because I knew it had to do with Babel and I saw the word act, A-K-T. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I know a catchphrase with this book is an act of translation is always an act of betrayal. I I was like, yeah, I know what that means. Yeah. And they're like, wow, you're fluent. <laughs> It's more than I know English, <laughs> as you can see on this sentence. Um, <laughs> but uh, an act of translation is an act of betrayal. It's because you can't always translate one on one. Like, it's, you lose a little bit of meaning. And there are some words um, that show that in a very uh, weird way, because there are German words that pop up in English, for example. Um, I'm Fernweh, for example. I don't know if it's, uh, it's common in... No, it means the opposite of being homesick, like wanting to go out into the world, Fernweh. No, or we don't have that. Kindergarten. You have kindergarten. We though, have right? kindergarten, yeah. but, yeah, but the German, stole it, the German right? yeah. stolen yeah. version. Yeah. <laughs> How many languages do you speak? So I speak English and Mandarin fluently, and I can read okay French and Italian, but that's because at my graduate program, we have this very strange course. It's called French for Reading and Italian for Reading. And the idea is grad students need to know how to read academic literature in other languages, but not necessarily speak it well. So over six weeks, we take this crash course, and we don't learn any pronunciation, and we don't learn any vocabulary. All we learn is grammar structures, like declensions and conjugations and some articles. And the idea is, with the aid of a dictionary, you can cobble together meaning. Mm -hmm. But that's not the, really the same. Did it work, speaking. though? Could you? It works for me. Like, yeah. if, I, if I have a news article in French, if I have a dictionary, I can figure <laughs> out what it says. So if someone asks you for directions, you don't know how to respond. But if they ask you about, like, a scientific fact, you can. Yes. Yeah, so by the end of this course, I could not order at a bakery, but I could read an article about like DNA sequencing. Oh my God, <laughs> <laughs> this is crazy. And you have actually studied in Oxford yourself, but also in Yale, Cambridge. Is it fair to say that you pursue a career as a, a scholar as much as you do as a writer? Yeah, I really want to be a professor because I love teaching. I, I love working with undergraduates because I feel like I learn so much from my students and I think teaching also makes you better at the fields that, that you need to prepare because you need to know more than the students, right? So you have to <laughs> study much harder Sometimes, before yeah. class. And the amazing thing about the students I work with is that they're very bright, they're hardworking, but they can also be so dim sometimes in very surprising ways. So I had a student who stood up and went to the board and gave this wonderful explanation explanation of how British colonialism in the Punjab created the economic circumstances for the first waves of Indian migration to Canada. And then he turned around and asked me, well, to which way did they migrate, east or west? And I had to teach him where the Atlantic and the Pacific Oceans <laughs> were. So it's, it's just a delight. I really love teaching. Oh, that's great. And um, you, you do love writing too, obviously. How do you manage your time? Because I studied, and I studied like communications. It's not, it's like an Abitur in NRW. It doesn't count. <laughs> um, it's so nice of you to laugh because it's a German joke. But um, how do you manage to combine both worlds without having a burnout? 
I cry a lot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Actually, there's this German word that one of my undergraduate advisors taught me. Maybe you can correct my pronunciation. It's like Sitzfleisch. 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 Yeah. Oh, yeah. And Very important. I, I, maybe you can, maybe it means something different in the German context, but he told me it means the ability to sit on your ass and yes. get something mm -hmm. done. And he said, if you can't sit on your ass, then you'll never succeed. So I have a lot of practice of sitting on <laughs> my ass. You have a favorite word? A favorite? So they asked me this at every single event when I first went I on I thought I was so original that. asking the question. No. Well, the thing is, it's like asking somebody, what's your favorite book? Because if somebody ah, asked oh. me what my... <laughs> thank you. <laughs> well, if somebody asked me what my favorite book is, I suddenly forget every book I've ever read yeah. in my entire life. But somebody taught me a German word last night, and I hope I'm pronouncing it right. It's like Kleinalt, like when you treasure something or it's very valuable to you. Oh, I don't know. Klein 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 old. Yeah. Ah, yeah. And, and yeah. she said it, it can mean like literally a treasure, but mm -hmm. also metaphorically something a treasure. So I said, oh, now that my memory with you is a Klein old. And she said, oh, that's and, so sweet. And now this will be a treasured <laughs> memory for me too. I oh, love the uh, yeah. Finnish word, I think. Morkis. Morkis. It's the hangover, uh, but not the physical one, but the moral one. Like when you were drinking and the next day you're ashamed of it. They have a <laughs> word for that. That's insane. Finish? Just this one More word. Hangover. Yes. I love that. <laughs> and you have also studied in Oxford. Um, and it's a magical place, of course. But what specifically made you go, you know what? I have to write about this place. I'll tell you, there is a moment maybe during my second month when I was at Oxford. And I was walking home alone at night, and the moon was out, and it was silent. And this is a very old city, so when you see nobody else around, you could be at any time period over the last thousand years, right? And as I was walking home, I started hearing this singing, this just this angelic choral music. And, and I thought, my god, like the ghosts, they're <laughs> after me. But really, a lot of the Oxford colleges have chapel choirs. And they were rehearsing and the music was carrying down the street and, and bouncing off the stones. And in and, and that moment, I thought, wow, like I really feel like I've been transported to a different time and place. And I wanted to keep that feeling with me. Yeah, it's, uh, I didn't know it. I, I always knew Oxford was an old like university, but it's really old. Yeah, really, like, really they haven't, old. They didn't teach calculus for 700 years because it wasn't invented <laughs> when... <laughs> Oxford was, was founded. And you do describe the university with a lot of love, but you also criticize it. Uh, in Babel, for example, they use magic to help England yeah, colonize the world and basically enslave, enslave people. So it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's not just love, but it's also a lot of criticism. And how much of that do you see happening in the real world, of course, without the magic? It's something I think about all the time as a graduate student at Yale and working with students at elite institutions because it's such a wonderful privilege to be in that space, to have access to almost every academic text that's been published anywhere in the world just at your fingertips, right? Access to all of this knowledge and all these talks and to be in an environment brimming with intellectual potential. You know, any room you could walk into might be a conference on a topic that could open up your worlds. But at the same time, I'm deeply concerned that students just come here to replicate an elite class. Mm -hmm. And I am most anxious of all about the idea of the ivory tower, right? Students coming to a space and living in cloistered, beautiful campuses where they don't have to think about the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. They just live in a space of abstract ideas and then they graduate into careers that are popular on campus just to earn a lot of money and in a lot of context participate in quite exploitative industries. And I've seen a lot of students come in with quite radical ideas and, and they want to change the world and they want to learn so much and help others. And by the time they graduate, they just want to be lawyers. <laughs> Sorry, if anybody is a lawyer, you know, there are different kinds of lawyers that discriminate. But I am thinking constantly about how you move through that space and hold on to what matters to you and, and go back into the world and give back rather than just keep drinking the champagne and feeling very special about yourself because you're in a campus like that. And did you ever 
drink the champagne? Like, did you have a moment where you thought, you know what, that's not going into the right direction for me, or have you been always, uh, have you always been uh, strong? I, I think I'm human, right? Yeah. So I love, I think one of the contradictions at the heart of Babel is wanting so badly to belong to that elite yes. space, to feel like you've always been somebody who would dress nicely and drink champagne and walk through those hallowed halls. And of course, when you're 20, 21, it feels amazing and you want to feel like that for the rest of your life. And I was very lucky that I had quite radical friends and mentors who reminded me that I can't be looking out for myself, that my presence at these institutions is not radical, it's not a revolution, it's just that I was very fortunate and I had opportunities that most people don't. So it must always be about how do I use the resources at my disposal to give back and change structural conditions for others. Yeah. That being said, I also hate the taste of champagne. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what you just said is um, rings very true, I think, especially for people who uh, are immigrants or have immigrant parents. Uh, and the uh, main character in the book also is an immigrant. And it was really refreshing to read about the time period that's generally like visually appealing. Um, but without blocking out the negative stuff. And I just thought it was really great because uh, oftentimes you see like Netflix movies or just movies in general and it's like, that's a beautiful time. I wish I could live there. And then you go, oh wait, no, racism. I forgot about that. Uh, so it was really great and uh, to read about it. And um, in your work in general, not only in Babel, you articulate the thematic arguments you make uh, pretty clearly. And I feel like that's something that used to be more common and now is almost frowned upon when you read a book and you read and you understand what the writer wants to tell you because he or she is actually telling it. Um, do you agree? Do you feel the same? This is a complicated topic. I've been thinking about this for a long time. You know, art for art's sake or art that's political. Is art bad if it has a political argument? Is it just baseless propaganda? And the people who hate my work would say, oh, it's just propaganda. She's just a crazy leftist and she just wants to scold everybody about colonialism. And I don't see my work that way. I, I think there is some aesthetic value in it. But when people complain that too much modern literature isn't literary enough, that the author is being very transparent about their politics. The things to remember are, first of all, there is no art that isn't political, right? There are no stories that are told without context. They all assume a certain point of view. They all assume a value system. They all assume things about what's normal, what isn't, who's in the room, who's not in the room, who you see on the street, who you don't, and if we, if we approach some texts and think that, oh, they're completely apolitical, they're not trying to make an argument about society at, at all, it's because we think that is the norm. Mm -hmm. And any book that wants to challenge that is automatically classified as too political for my liking, and, and I'm frustrated with that. The second thing I would say is that art has been political for a very long time, and so is literature. So when people, valorize the Victorian era, Victorian canon, right? And they think, you know, literature has gotten so nasty since Dickens' time. Well, Dickens was writing explicitly about the social inequality that he saw around him. He was writing about the class divisions of the Industrial Revolution and what was happening to children working in factories. And he was writing about the poverty that he witnessed in, in a very ugly Victorian London. And it wasn't just pretty, gorgeous, you know, period piece all the time. The actual text of Dickens is very gritty and realist, which people don't give it enough credit for. So I don't think I'm doing anything special beyond the tradition of the Victorian canon. Yeah, and I feel like it's uh, a tradition. I mean, I, I feel like books used to be more political or were allowed to be more political without being named as a political book. Um, and uh, so it was really refreshing to have a story that was so captivating, but also not ignoring the things you think are important just because, oh no, it's not artsy enough then. Uh, so yeah, I had a great time. I'm not done yet, so please don't spoil the ending, <laughs> anybody. Um, yeah, do we have questions from the chat? Yeah, we have a lot of questions over here. For example, um, somebody is asking if you could tell us something more about your writing process with uh, Babel. Well, with Babel, 
it was both the hardest and easiest book I'd worked on at that time. It was the easiest because there's absolutely nothing around to distract me because it w there was a pandemic. Yeah. So oh, but, yeah. I couldn't see my friends. I couldn't go shopping. I couldn't go to parties. And even though sitting down at my desk felt like I was pulling my hair out, pulling my teeth out, trying to focus, at least structurally, there was just nothing getting in my way. Mm. So, so you started in 2020? 2020, oh, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, and I think only under those very cloistered conditions could I write something that is so intertextual that involves so much deep research into the Victorian era? Yeah, if era. you did not uh, finish your degree, I think they should just give you the degree in language <laughs> for Babel. You can talk to my advisor. <laughs> I felt like me. I earned a degree just by reading it. By reading it. <laughs> yeah, we have, um, we have a second question, uh, which is uh, very, uh, very cool, I, I think. Um, how did the success of this book, which was huge, impact your life? I actually try very hard to not let it impact my life because I think if you get too obsessed about reviews and sales and critical reception, then you get too distracted to focus on working on the next story. So I try to preserve conditions to remain the same kind of person I was who, who wrote Babel. I would say the biggest change is that I travel a lot more now, so I can randomly get up and go to Munich in the middle <laughs> of the semester, Welcome. have a beer, and then fly back and continue teaching. So that's that's just been a delight, and I try to always say yes to travel opportunities, except for when they interfere with the teaching schedule. <laughs> well, I'm really glad you traveled to Munich uh, yeah. to meet us. If you don't have any more pressing yeah, I, I, questions... Yeah, I don't think we have more time. Yeah. There are a ton of questions, but no time left. So I would say thank you so much for joining us today, and I'm really looking forward to your next book, Yellow Face. I don't Yellow know the face, German yeah. title. Yellow Yellow face. Face. <laughs> That's a great title. Some words just don't translate, so you have to keep the original. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Rebecca Kwang.